Well, look, Dad, your friend is building it. My friends, we were downtown driving around the new soccer stadium that is being built right here in St. Louis, Missouri, when my son Patrick yelled that out from the back seat of the car. Look, Dad, your friends are building it. He was referring to my friends at Keeley Companies. Keeley Companies is proud to be a part of the team that is bringing Major League Soccer to America's first soccer capital right here in St. Louis, Missouri. As construction partners of the St. Louis City Stadium, they are looking forward for this project to be a place for entertainment, camaraderie, and passion for generations to come. You can learn more about that project and look what else they're building, Dad, by visiting them right now online at KeeleyCompanies.com. Welcome to the Live Inspired Podcast with John O'Leary. John is the number one national best-selling author of the book On Fire. He's a world-class inspirational speaker, and he's the host of the Live Inspired podcast. John interviews extraordinary individuals on their life story so that you can wake up from accidental living and more fully live your life story. Here's your host, John O'Leary. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Live Inspired podcast with John O'Leary. If I began this episode by sharing with you the limitless unbelievable accomplishments of our guest, you might be at risk of turning the channel and saying, you know what? That sounds like a little more than I can handle in my life. I don't know if I can travel halfway around the world. I don't know if I can make a difference in the life of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of children in Nepal. I don't know if I can start a woman's center there. I don't know if I can start a school there and a home for kids there. So rather than going through the list of accomplishments for our guest, how about this? One. One. That's the number of children that Maggie began the journey with. Just one. She saw a need in a community and she recognized, although she may not be able to radically change that community or that country or poverty in that area, she could make a difference for one. And then she recognized in doing that with one child, I guess I could make a difference with one more. And then one more, and then one more, and then onward from there. So my friends, I'm going to brag on our guest. Her name is Maggie Doyne here just for a moment. She was the 2015 CNN Hero of the Year. She's been rated as Forbes as a top 30 under 30 social entrepreneur. You're going to hear about how she accomplished those things. But more than that, you're going to hear the story of what happens when you make your life about something bigger than yourself and what happens when you start with the one and how that next right step leads to the next right step leads to the next right step. But then looking back at it, you recognize in doing this one by one, you change the world starting with your own. So here's my encouragement for you today. Buckle up, get ready for an amazing ride with an amazing human being who is making an amazing difference in the community, reminding us that we can too. So without further ado, let me introduce you to my friend and soon to be yours. Her name is Maggie Doyne. Maggie, welcome to Live Inspired with John O'Leary. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Was, as you heard a moment ago, I, I am probably the president of your fan club. I love the work that you do. I recently read the book Between the Mountain and the Sky and was blown away by it. And by the end of this conversation, I know our listeners and viewers will be as well. But for those who vaguely remember hearing the name Maggie, or they meet you in a grocery store here in the United States or somewhere in an airport, and they ask you, Maggie, Maggie, what do you do? How do you answer that question these days? I live in Nepal. (laughs) I am the mother to 58 children. And... I am working to create a world where every child is safe and educated and loved. And I'm doing that through empowering Nepal's impoverished children. Well, right now, my mom, who's, I think, my biggest fan, she's president of the John O'Leary fan club, just sat up in her seat because she thought six kids raising them was a lot. Mom, you got, you got, a, you got a real challenger right now. More than 50 kids, a mother of more than 50 children. Maggie, it's an incredible story. I do want to share it with our listeners today, but it doesn't begin in Nepal. Uh, I'm going to have you hop on the flight, join us back here in the United States, and uh, talk a little bit about growing up in the in the U.S. and New Jersey. I'm a Jersey girl through and through. I grew up on a cul-de-sac in the suburbs 
of a little town called Mendham. There were white picket fences and little colonial homes and petunias. And I went to public school. I had a trampoline in my backyard. My dad was the teacher. My mom was a nurse. I played sports, a lot of soccer, just your average, typical Jersey upbringing with a ponytail. I babysat. I was a camp counselor, just everything normal. I wanted to go to college. That was me at 17 years old. When you look toward college with that ponytail and those shin guards on, what, what were you imagining you would do later on in life? I didn't know. I had no idea what my purpose was or like what I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. I wasn't that kid that was like, I'm going to go to medical school or I want to study business. Like I just, I, I think I turned 17 and I was just like, whoa, I know all the things I was supposed to do and the SAT score. And it was that community where everybody was asking, where are you getting into college? What's the name of the school? And all of a sudden I just woke up one morning and I was like, whoa, I don't know the answer to any of these questions. I'm about to like go take out loans and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on supposedly trying to figure this out. I was that kid that had no clue. That was the beginning of the journey. Mm. You know, I wrote a couple of years ago about the power of a gap year and in doing so had a lot of positive feedback from it and a lot of negative feedback. A lot of folks told me I was entitled to even suggest this was a possibility for kids. <clears throat> and then you just brought up again, why maybe it's not about entitlement. Maybe it's about making sure we discover who we are before we make an investment in someone else's dream. A couple hundred thousand dollar four-year investment in a dream that may not even be ours. So you decide rather than taking out those loans and rather than going off to a school, not even knowing who you are, or what you're about, you're going to try to figure that stuff out. T talk about how you learned about what a gap year was and what your first step toward it. I totally get the hate and the questioning and the privilege involved with this decision that's only some of us get to make. I will say there's a lot of really good scholarship programs out there and financial aid, just like there is for college. And I would argue that it is a year on, it's not a year off, it's a year of introspection. I would also argue that today's youth have lost the time to even ask some of those important questions, the rite of passage just the introspection to be like, I don't know why I'm here. And college culture in America, there's a lot of drugs, a lot of drinking. We accept that privilege in our culture, but we don't accept that maybe kids at 17 years old need a year to see the world outside of themselves, to step off the beaten track, to ask ourselves what success is. I own that I came from privilege. I own that I grew up with everything opportunity in the world, but I also didn't know anything else outside of the suburbs of New Jersey. I had to figure that out and, and learn what that looked like. And for me, taking a year of cultural immersion, of leaving the world in the bubble that I knew in New Jersey and stepping out outside the four walls of a classroom was so important. I got my passion for learning back. I don't think you can figure out how you're supposed to serve the world when you don't know what your gifts or your talents are. And when you're 17 years old, like it's just, we're asking our youth of today to do things that are just not feasible. You can't yeah. always know what your path is going to be when you're 17 or 18 and you've never left your little hometown on a cul-de-sac. So for me, it was like an amazing opportunity. And that gap year took me around the world. And ultimately I ended up in Northeastern India and did start to reflect on my privilege, did start to reflect on the state of the world, started to understand refugees, started to understand conflict, the effects of poverty, child labor, um, mm. and a lot of those questions came to mind. Well, you make a friend while you are in Northeast yeah. India, who is a refugee, as I understand it. She did come from a different country. She came from a place you'd never seen on the map called Nepal. Mm -hmm. To talk about exactly. that relationship and the desire to take this long journey back toward her, her town. Yeah, unlike me, Sunita knew exactly where she wanted to go in life. She wanted to become a doctor, which she has. She had questions about where she came from. And she was like, I left my village when I was eight years old. I don't know where I came from. She was missing you know, memories. She had fled. She was a child of war. She'd fled civil war at the age of eight and hadn't been back. And so the two of us together through our friendship make this plan 
to go and find her village and find her home and try to retrace the footsteps of where she came from in this rural Himalayan region called Kalikot. On this journey, we were hoping to kind of just see the state of Nepal again, try to find her home. Yeah, I'd also seen the refugee side of things where families were sleeping under pieces of plastic by the side of the road where children were being trafficked, forced into labor, families were being separated. So we both wanted to see the Nepal side of things and, and get answers to some of those questions. Here you are 17, maybe 18 at that time. You are a baby. You're from the States. You're in India. You're on now, as I understand it, a 26 hour bus ride. That is a long time to be on a bus. And then when you get off, the journey continues. Just take us forward from there. Bus ride ends. We cross the border on a pony cart. At some point, the road comes to a stop and there's just a foot trail headed off into the Himalayan mountains. And we walked for three more days on this footpath into the beautiful Himalayan villages of Nepal. We ultimately landed on this ledge and we were overlooking this beautiful village called Oda. And Sunita pointed right away to the center of the village, which was her house. We found her home. And I fell in love with this country. It was stunningly beautiful. The people were amazing and welcoming and unbelievably connected in community, strength, resilience, love, looking after each other. We also saw the raw effects of civil war and what it does, how it had shut down schools and ravaged homes and destroyed families and huge loss of human life. So it was kind of these two things, like watching my friend go through this incredible experience falling in love with the people but also seeing just like the stark and raw reality of, of war and, and poverty and, and violence and what it does and, and just as a level set for our our listeners who haven't yet read your book or may not be familiar with your story you don't know the language at all is that right oh no i knew nothing really like i just was going on this journey with my friend what keeps you in this community then? Why, why not continue the journey forward? You've been to the South Pacific and then India and now Nepal. Why not keep moving? Why not keep discovering who you are in new places? Ultimately on this trip, we're taking in a lot of stories. Sunita's home had been converted into a Malice rebel base camp. Children were cold. We were seeing the effects of hunger between growing seasons in a culture of subsistence farming. We were seeing schools shut down. And then we started to meet children. There was this one dry riverbed running through a small trading post town. And I was taking it all in, just like taking in the stories and taking in everything that I'd seen in that year. And I looked up and I saw dozens and dozens of children breaking rocks with mallets uh, on the side of a riverbed. And they were grabbing big pieces of rocks and bringing them to the side. And three-year-olds and seven-year-olds and eight-year-olds were breaking them into gravel which I later found out they were using to sell in bags at the end of the day for about a dollar. And it was that moment that the world just stopped for me. And I was like, how have we allowed this to happen? How is this the reality in the world right now? How do I live in a world where it's okay for children to break rocks, to have their most basic human needs met? I locked eyes with one child, her name was Hema. She was seven years old, six years old. And she just looked up at me and said, Namaste, Didi, which means hello, big sister. And I was just like, I can't do anything about all the intense problems of this war. I can't do anything about 152 million orphan children. But what if I could do something for Hema? And just like locking eyes with her, I think I saw a piece of myself and went back in time and all, all the things I'd been given to make me who I am and who I was. And realizing that her reality was breaking rocks to survive. Mm. It was just wrong. I started to ask a lot of questions. It ultimately just made me so curious. And that set me on the journey of starting to look at education and how Hema's life could change with schooling. You know, so often, whether it's here in the United States or somewhere in Nepal or anywhere in between, we see something that we know is broken and wrong. And then we step on and step away and look away and get busy. I'm just curious, as best as you can now determine, like what was it about that moment and this beautiful little girl named Hema and her breaking those rocks on that day as a six-year-old child that had you not only 
moved, but then moved to move, like moved to say, no, not, we can do something for this one. Turning my back and going back to college, that image would have haunted me for the rest of my life. It felt easier to look at it straight on and try to dig in and solve that problem. And in the beginning, I did think it was really simple. I was like, what? It's like $5 for admission fee. It's $7 for a backpack, a uniform. Yeah. There's a school right up the road. Like, what are these barriers? I can do that with my babysitting money. And there was something about my own youth that was just like, no, I'm not going to stand for this. No, like I want to walk across this riverbed and I want to see no children breaking rocks. Like, why can't we live in a world like that? And I took it on as like a challenge of can I somehow help and empower the community to help? And what does help even look like? But is there something that I can bring that can change this reality? I don't want to accept this. I want to try to change at least Hema's life. As you know, when you get started and you take that first step, it just like you start to think and wheels start turning and we had a team around me. Like it just was, it became amazing what happened. So you take a look at Hema and you see those little eyes and that brilliant smile and that sweet voice and that orange dress. And you decide, uh, I'm going to start. I'm going to do something. So what do you do? Take us forward from there. I started to study the issue and the issue was just, there were these barriers because she needing the income and work. And there was just too many barriers for her to get to school. Hema had a single mom. She had many siblings. She was a girl. So I just started to pick off the issues one by one. And I learned that just a few years of primary school education can change the trajectory of a child's life and end cycles of poverty with basic literacy. Hema's mom had never gone to school. And so it became really clear to me with all of my research and what we knew at that time that education was everything. The opportunity to go to school, the opportunity to become literate. There's incredible markers for when a child goes to a few years of primary school and becomes literate. They marry later, they have fewer children, they have more agency over their life, they are able to change their future, they have more economic prospects. It changes countries' GDPs, mm. less likely to contract HIV AIDS and life-threatening illnesses. So it was just like, oh, this is simple. Hema goes to school for a few years. Hema's life becomes dramatically better. And I, I, that was the beginning of the journey. And then, I, and then it became two kids. And why not three? And why not four? And why not five? And then I was like, well, it needs more than just education is like up here in the hierarchy of needs. Yes. If a child doesn't have parents or family or home or clean water to drink, health services, nutrition, then we need to address those issues. So that became the home. And then we kind of just built this team with the community and started addressing the problems one by one with starting with the rock breakers, the kids bugging, bugging in the bus station, orphan children who had lost everything. And we started working again in partnership with local people. My co-founder Tope was an orphan himself. He became part of the team and we went from there. Tope sounds like an amazing guy. I look, I look forward to a book coming out someday with his picture on the front of it because <laughs> He also strikes me as being a remarkable, humble hero of this journey. You tell the story in the book brilliantly, but the Babysitter's Club. So at some point, we got to fund these uniforms and these books and these tuitions. And it's not seemingly a lot of money, but it is some money. And you have an idea that you could take some of the babysitting proceeds from what age 12 until you were 18 here in the States. You call home. Talk about the conversation with your mom and dad. Yeah, I call my mom and dad from this rickety old phone booth on the side of the road. And I'm like, mom, dad, can you send me my $5,000 in babysitting money? There was a piece of land for sale for exactly $5,000. And at this point, I knew we wanted to put roots down and create a center and a home base. At this point, they realized that it's not just a gap year, it's a gap life. <laughs> and they asked lots of questions. And ultimately, they sent me the money. We ended up purchasing land digging holes for the foundation because all that, that's all we had was shovels and like some eager local people. And then I came back uh, to New Jersey to babysit some more, thinking very naively that I could just babysit and send money and finish off the house in the center. The naivety that you had, though, allowed you to do this radical stuff that from a distance seems impossible. 
but when you're on the floor looking into a child's eyes and you're just doing the, the next right thing and then the next right thing, it's working. You're, you're breaking down these barriers. So you come back to New Jersey, you start babysitting and you recognize we need to turn on the water even more rapidly than babysitting dollars can fund. Talk about a few of the things that you did that, that opened up some new investment sources. I was so young that I knew that I didn't know all the answers, which was great because I had this naivete, but I also had this like, I need to find people to help me. And in that process, I started to find mentors. I started to find books. I started to find why the industry development had failed, where, you know, the implications of poverty. And then I found people and just a team. Everyone got really revved and fired up and started pitching in. We created a 501c3 foundation. We built a board. Um, we went in with a strategic plan and a budget that started off really small and then grew over the years. Maggie, what um, was your first budget? Like $26,000. It was to finish off the home and enroll 60 kids into school. Again, like it was small and it was step-by-step. Step. It was one child at a time. It was organic. So as we'd get into the field, we'd start to understand the issues with the community and we'd need to like build on one more thing, another thing. You know, a huge uh, leading cause of death is actually diarrhea from dysentery. Well, clean water initiatives, a medical clinic, immunizations, trauma healing, social workers and counselors. We needed that. We needed soccer and sports and joy and art and music and a library. And from there, we kind of built it out. We realized the Women's Center was really key involving mothers, preventing children from becoming orphans in the first place with economic training and, and vocational opportunities for women who didn't get a chance to go to school. And yeah, we just started like troubleshooting and working together and building resources to then fund the direct action and change and impact we wanted to make on the ground. So it starts with that, the, the babysitting and then a little board and then raising the $26,000 in year one. But your good work continues to spread in ways that you you can't design as part of an, an annualized plan. It just sometimes happens. Schools hear about you and they, they reach out to you. You have a garage sale and it makes it into the front paper. And they may not have defined it exactly the way you had hoped, but it gets the word out. Cosmo eventually hears about you. Would you, would you share that story? I'm raising my kids in Nepal. I've at this point kind of become a mother. They've come into our home. We had nothing. I mean, no running water, no electricity for 18 hours a day. I'm just like hustling to make each and every end meet one step at a time. And I get this call from New York City and it's a girl named Rachel. And she's like, I've got amazing news. You've been selected as Cosmo Girl of the Year. It comes with a prize of $25,000. And I'm just like reeling. I'm like, we're going to dig a well. I'm going to paint the kids' bedrooms yellow and blue. And I'm going to build on more bedrooms. We're going to have food for the next few months. Like all the things I can do with that $25,000, huge amount of money. And part of the prize was that it came with a makeover and being whisked away into New York City and the whole like story in the magazine. I just talk about navigating these two worlds and you know I'm just thinking of like I want clean water and like an right. abil ability to like flush the toilet and get the lice out of my hair and then I have to go like do this whole makeover but it was the first time the story really broke and I learned so much about young women in this country and the kind of stories that they were hungry for and what they wanted and it wasn't about the makeover it was about like actually we all have the power within us to make a difference there's a lot I want to follow up with because it goes on from there around the, the desire to make a difference and other things that come out of that spread. But you also mentioned this idea of navigating two worlds. So you leave Nepal, you leave your children, you come to New York City, man. How do you match up those two different styles of living when they are so different from one another? Honestly, just gratitude. We don't have like a washing machine in Nepal. You wash your clothes on a rock. You'd come home and there'd be a washing machine and you're just like, whoa, that's incredible. Like, thank you. I think I was really good right away at like realizing it didn't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. There's no why to any of this. Why were you born the way you were born? I was born the way I was born, where I was born. Like, it's just, why does it make sense? It's more about how can we create 
a world that's better for everyone. And I got really focused on the how and trying not to judge like a $5 Starbucks or a $200 pair of jeans or the fact that my local town was disagreeing over the local Dunkin' Donuts and where it should go. And I was just like, thank you for all of this. Did I have moments where I felt really judgy and like, oh my God, I just wanted to scream. Like, do you realize what's happening in the world? I have those moments all the time, but I'm also really grateful. I just learned how to be really grateful. The self-righteousness of like, ah, do you know what's happening to kids? It doesn't work. It doesn't create change. Shaming and blaming and pointing fingers. It's, we have to focus on how, like, how do we create more quality, more justice, more opportunity for people who don't have it, more safety in this world, peace, dialogue instead of hate. I tried on that look for size. Like I tried on the whole, like, do you know what's happening to kids in the fall? And I realized right away, like it wasn't going to work. And I, I shifted to like, just be grateful for what we have and give back where we can. What I love so much about your story and your life is that if anyone else was sharing what you're sharing, we could shrug it off as being Pollyannish. Like just kind of, <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. I'm glad she read a couple of books on her gap year. But when the woman sharing these sentences is raising 58 children who call her mom, when you're running a school for children, when you have a beautiful center for women to find work that matters, to figure out that they matter, all of a sudden, it's not just kind of some flighty Pollyannish statement. It's a statement of truth that you've got to sit up and take note on. So at kind of backing up a little bit more, you received the $20,000 from Cosmo and then a hundred thousand from do something. And then all these other things continually come out of it. You're the 2015 CNN person of the year, which is incredible. You speak on a stage before you is Bon Jovi, heard him, decent guy, pretty good musician after you is Oprah. And in between those two presenters, you. So, so my question is, you look back on some of these experiences from your life and they're not that long ago. What has surprised you most about it? Yeah, it was like the snowball effect. And it was a time and a message in the world that was somehow needed and a story that resonated that you can make a difference. It does matter. Everybody tuned in. They trusted me probably because I looked like them, which for better or for worse, was a message that I was able to carry given the fact that I came from that environment. Tope and I were all about just sharing the story so we could, we knew that it made a difference. It makes an impact. When I spoke up at Forbes, like ultimately I was just like, tell the story. This message cannot get out soon enough. I felt the sense of urgency. Then get back to Nepal, use the resources and disperse it to children who need this for their survival. And then ultimately designing a model for change and impact that can work, a blueprint for serving children. Like I, I, Tope and I always thought like, if we could do this in the most rural part of Nepal with natural disasters, following civil war, food deficit region, high maternal mortality rate, high child mortality rate, if we can do this with the local community, maybe it can be done anywhere. And we kind of set out to prove that model and that thesis using strategy, using more than just like, oh, happy kids. Like the basis of everything is just love and kindness and our human connection. Like if a child is given a loving childhood, there is science to that of what happens and what they do in the world. That when kids are given safety and love and food, it's simple, but it's everything if we can make a better world for children, that our world will be more peaceful. I set out with that message and I set out to prove that it worked. It did work. We have 166 kids now in college. We hear sometimes the numbers and then we shrug or we take another sip of our latte. You're talking about these kids who 15 years ago were breaking rock at age five, who today through the work that you and others have done <laughs> with you are now in colleges around the, around the world. And then called also not only to educate themselves for themselves, but to called also to be generous and to give back profusely. So yes, it works. And yes, it has changed the world. And the way it is happening is the painful way it's always happened, which is just one life at a time. Believing that it's possible 
Because I do think we're in this fear mode of there's so many problems. Right. We're terrified. There's this sense of like, how are we ever going to get through these times? And then we lose hope. And so we put up walls and barriers of what we can control and the little circle of people we can protect. At some point, we just have to come together and say, no, we can do better. And we can all agree on some basic fundamental things. And I hope that when you and I are old and gray, we can look back and say, this is the change that was made. You've mentioned this a couple of times. Now we'll let, let you spend a little <laughs> bit more time here. 58 children look, oh. look up to you and call, call you mom, you know, mama Maggie. That sounds really great. As we approach mother's day, like, well, how fun 58 cards. You're really a lucky woman. It also means an awful lot of heartache. Some of it mm. like paper cuts, some of it diapers, some of it dealing with fights and fevers, but other agonizing heartbreak. And you write about several examples in the book, but I, I think the most painful one is little Ravi. Would you just share to the extent you'd like part of Ravi's story? Ravi came into our home as an infant. He was a few months old, but he weighed about two pounds. He had a severe case of malnourishment and hunger after he lost his mother. We brought little Ravi in. He went through extensive treatment. He was our family. He was my son. He was so special. I just fell in love with him. And ultimately he died in a horrific and tragic accident. It was the worst thing I've ever been through. I didn't think I was going to survive. I thought I was going to die. I didn't think I'd ever be able to stand again. At this point, I'd seen a lot. I'd suffered a lot, as you know. I'd seen a lot of death. I'd seen a lot of loss. I think I still had this narrative that if you work hard enough and you do all the right things and you have hope and mm. you do that gritty work, that it's all going to be okay. And at this point in my life, I realized that sometimes it's just not, you know, horrible things happen. And it took a lot of rebuilding. It took a lot of work. It took a lot of therapy, a lot of grief counseling, and ultimately the book ended up being a lot about grief more so than I thought and healing from grief and how to go back at it again and return and have hope again. This is not an easy thing to bring forward and I appreciate you bringing it up. So then the question is after you go back to the States for, for help and reprieve and rest and therapy and the ability to breathe, why come back to Nepal and why go through the difficult work day after day like what what keeps you going yeah again and again and again yeah so many that the struggles like it, it's a constant uphill battle it's surrounded by joy and laughter and children and butterflies and flying kites but this is hard hard work so why John, that's, that's 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 why i wanted to write the book because a lot of times in the highlight reels like cover of the new york times cnn heroes honored by the dalai lama like it was this like this really high level, like, look, change happens. All you have to do is believe and work and babysitting money. Everybody loved that story, but underneath the surface of it was just like this grueling, horrific loss. And that we were just getting knocked down again and again and again and again, and, you know, taking on these incredibly difficult cases and. Or turning um, away cases that you wish you could have taken on. Like those were painful horrible pain and realizing just how dark and difficult the world can be. I was still a mother at the end of the day and I still had a life. I still had air in my lungs and a beating heart and love. I ended up starting to write the children love letters and like all of us folks who are mothers who go through grief or the loss of a child or the loss of a loved one, you're given a choice of like stay in bed in the dark and never get up again or get up and get back to where you're going. And and I thought my kids were worth that. Um, Mm. My children were worth that. And I was so fortunate enough to love again and ended up meeting my husband while I was in grief. You know, we ended up traveling back together. I, I still had light. I still had joy. I still had a future ahead of me, which I'm really grateful for. And there was still a lot of life to live. I'm going to ask you what several of the quotes from your book mean, only because I, I and I'll show you as, as validation, <laughs> I underlined the heck out of this thing, mm. marked a whole bunch of those pages up. And then from all those markings, wrote down about 11 quotes that I thought I would ask you about. But today, as we get ready to run out of time in a few moments, I'll probably only read three of these or so. But the first one is this. 
this comes directly from you, directly from the book. Love is the only restitution. Love is the only restitution. It isn't enough, but it's everything I have. Oh, I feel that. <laughs> you know, is it enough? That's one of the big questions of life. And that is the struggle. And that is the essence of why we're here. Yeah, sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes it is. It's one of my favorite quotes from the book, by the way. I'm so impressed <laughs> with, how, with, how, with how much you read. <laughs> you read that book and you read it good. <laughs> Well, there are, there are things that just pop, and that's certainly one of them, and, and many of these are similar, but here, here comes one as, as a man. It's painful for me to share, but I think I need to hear your understanding of what this quote means, so here it comes. Life is hard for everyone here, but whereas men struggle, women suffer. There are countries in this world where it's just way harder to be a woman. Less investment, less belief you know, married at an early age, victims of child marriage, the patriarchy. There was incredible violence against women. I had a case where a rapist raped a young person and the punishment for the perpetrator was to marry the victim. There's not a lot of justice, as much justice in a, in a patriarchal society. And we will not get to where we need to go in this world until men and women are truly equal and, and held in equal value. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're just not there yet. Absolutely. As I learned more from you in this book, that that's something that needs to be addressed. So I appreciated the quote and I appreciated the heart that wrote it. The, the next one, and maybe the final one that I'll leave you with is this one. You just spoke about Ravi. So I think I'll let you speak to this. Here it comes. You were writing about him after the loss and you wrote this slowly Though gratitude never dwarfs grief, the two began to stand together. You mean you never heal. Nothing's ever okay. It's never fine. You never get over or get through something like that. The two just stand together. Mm. And I would even argue that the joy and the love feels so much stronger because you've been in the depths of despair mm. and loss and grief. So the love just feels like so much more once you realize that we don't know how many moments we have that everything could disappear and just slip between our fingers at any moment. You hold on to the goodness and the joy so much more and they live in parallel to each other. And that's what it means to grieve. In a moment, we're going to move into what we call the Live Inspired Seven. But I, I do have kind of three questions I'd like to ask you around that idea of being a human is hard. So as we listen to your story, one of the first things we are at risk of thinking as listeners and viewers tuning in from around the U.S. and around the world is, wow, this girl has a wild life story. It ain't mine, and I may never go to Nepal. What does this mean for me? So the question then, Maggie, is this. The lessons that you've learned along the way, how do we apply them as we grocery shop, as we podcast, as we do life? What are some ordinary things that you are hoping your readers and that our listeners might receive from, from your message today? Mm, one small step, one small act. Take that one action. Everyone can mentor a child, support an organization, donate to the food bank, volunteer a little bit of your time. One small act of helping a neighbor, an act of love, an act of kindness, never underestimate the ripples that that can send out into the world. And that as a collective living in this way, leading with kindness, leading with love and generosity, never underestimate the power of that. Perfect. And I think many of us, as we journey through the day, see those opportunities to get involved, to make a difference, to smile or hold the door open or make an investment in, in, into an organization or a child. And then we take the next step in a different direction. And then we get busy. And then we turn on the radio a little too loud. And we forgot about what we were thinking about before. So the, the second question around that idea of being fully human is, what encouragement would you have for us to actually slow down long enough to do it? You, you when you saw that child in the riverbed, did something. And you continue to do something in mighty ways. How do I not only identify the need or the challenge or the opportunity, but to begin moving in the direction of it? Well, everything in our culture is like throwing 
so many things at us. There's so much noise, our phones, the media, materialism, having to buy the next thing. And I think sometimes I just want to be like, everybody just slow down, quiet down, get present, get still, tune out all of the noise and the having to be a certain thing, having to buy a certain thing, having to do a certain thing. And just like, let's look at each other and hold each other and try to tune out some of the noise of this world right now. What is the life legacy that we want to leave behind when we're not here anymore? So good. Where can we learn more about the work you do? Blinknow.org. Follow us on social media. Follow our website. We're the Blink Now Foundation. You are the Blink Now Foundation. And I'm speaking to its matriarch. And uh, <laughs> I love the fact that the $5,000 over six and a half years of babysitting has changed the lives of countless children in Nepal. And now our listeners are a little bit better because of it as well. As we get ready to wrap up this episode, we ask seven questions of all of our guests. And so I'm going to, I'm going to be guiding you through these as well, Maggie, as we uh, journey down this path together. Number one, what's been the most impactful or inspiring book you've ever read? There's like 10 coming to mind. I'm going to say the end of poverty. The end of poverty. What's it about? It really looks at the realistic ways that we can end the situation that we're in and explains it. It's by an author, Jeffrey Sachs, and it's incredible. And it's one of the first books that led me on the path that I'm on. Wow. What's one positive characteristic or one trait that you possessed as a little girl with that ponytail on that trampoline with those shin guards jumping in New Jersey that you wish you exhibited as brilliantly today? fearlessness <laughs> as the mother of 58 gets ready to board a plane from california into new york do a continue the book tour then go on to nepal this june uh fearlessness is the answer well so, you, don't uh, you just get more and more i just get more and more afraid with every kid i have and the will say <laughs> being naive can be really good a good place for your brain sometimes <laughs> correct and, and trying to live there is part of the call of being childlike. Just live mm -hmm. there looking up as if anything is possible because it might be. Mm -hmm. So the, the next question is, if your home in Nepal caught, caught fire and all 58 children are out safely, it's safe, and you have an opportunity to run in and grab one item, what is the one thing you would race back outside with? My journal. Writing has just been such a tool, a cathartic healing tool, writing their stories, writing them love letters. It's just the reason the book's here. Mm. It's been a healing force in my life. If you could sit on a bench on a gorgeous day and have a long conversation with anyone living or deceased, who would you like to be seated next to? Living or deceased? I mean, Navi. <laughs> I would take him back in a heartbeat, have a conversation, just tell him how much I love him and I love him. <laughs> What's the best advice you've ever received? Just keep going and you will feel joy again. When things seem really dark and impossible, you just don't know what's around the corner. You will feel joy, you will feel hope. Something can change in the blink of an eye. Mm. What would you tell your 20 year old self? You've begun the journey. You're in Nepal, I believe at that point, but uh, you've learned a lot in the few years since then. What would you tell your 20 year old self? Slow down, take care of your health, <laughs> sleep a little more, you know, eat a little more, like just, just like when you need a minute, take a breath. Cause I just didn't know what was gonna, it was hard. I didn't know how hard it was gonna be. I had to warn her to just like take a breather now and again. It has been said <laughs> that all great philanthropist humans, mothers can have their lives summed up in one sentence. How would you like yours to read? She made the world better for children. Megan Dorn, you have indeed made the world better <laughs> for children and for us. And I'm grateful to consider you a friend and someone that I look up to. 
Oh, likewise. Thank you. My friend, you are listening to the voice and the heart of a woman named Maggie Doyne. She is the author of the book Between the Mountain and the Sky. I highly recommend it. Maggie, thank you for living so boldly, so vibrantly, and being such an encouragement to so many. My friends, as I was reading Maggie's book, learning about her journey, hearing her speak, I was reminded of something pretty simple, but so frequently we miss it. Here it is. Small actions matter. The little things aren't. It's not that hard to change the world. We just have to be bold enough and faithful enough and courageous enough to take the right next step. And you don't have to travel around the world or board a jumbo jet to begin making that difference. We can begin where we are, right in our own backyards. And rather than waiting for tomorrow, I say we start today. It's a great reminder, and I'm grateful that Maggie models this brilliantly through her life. If you enjoyed hearing how Maggie created purpose in her life, let me give you one more podcast suggestion that you will love. His name is Scott Harrison. Scott's another one of my buddies. He's a remarkable guy. By age 28, Scott had made... A lifetime, no, not of impact, a lifetime of mistakes. His journey, though broken, ultimately led him to starting a charity called Charity Water. It's an organization that revolutionized the not-for-profit model and in doing so provides clean drinking water to 8 million people. It's an awesome organization founded, started, sparked by a remarkable, broken, wonderful human being. You can check out that at episode 104. That's right. Go across the dial to the Live Inspired Podcast, episode 104. Scott's going to share the lessons on redemption, on creative problem solving, and creating purpose in our lives and in our work. It's going to remind us that in making big change, though difficult, it's possible to ensure that the best is absolutely yet to come. Check it out, my friends. Episode 104. So I want to thank you all for being part of this journey, part of our family, part of this Live Inspired podcast community. So for this time and until next time, my name is John O'Leary. Today is your day, family. Live Inspired. Well, Keeley Company's culture sets them apart and their people live out the unique culture every single day. Perhaps it's best seen through their philanthropic foundation called Keeley Cares. It was built on a passion for giving of their time, their talent, and their treasure to help improve the communities in which they live and where they work. We're so excited that they were named one of the top corporate philanthropists by the St. Louis Business Journal for 2021. You can learn more about Keeley Cares by visiting them online at keeleycompanies.com.